Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. This time we're gonna talk a little bit more about the Moscow trials, which were basically three political treason trials which took place in the USSR in 1936, 1937 and 1938 against several people who were in the Trotskyist, Zinovievite and Buharinist opposition against the Soviet government. They were accused of treason, trying to overthrow the government, committing acts of terrorism and murder, conspiring together with other enemies of the Soviet Union and also conspiring with hostile foreign states. It's obviously a very famous case, very famous incident. I already have a very long video trilogy on the Moscow trials where I go through the whole thing uh, pretty thoroughly, uh, so I recommend that you check those out. I'm not going to go over everything to the same degree in this one. Even though I still stand by everything I said in the trilogy, and even though I think all the facts in it are correct, in terms of structure and in terms of how I explain things, if I did that today, I would make it a little different, but not very different. But in any case, uh, I just thought that we would um, talk a little bit more about the Moscow trials and just uh, discuss some interesting points. I talked a little bit about some of these things when I did my review of all the books by historian J. Arch Getty. I'll also link that video in the description. But in any case, let's just get into it. Apparently, communist historian Grover Fur has also made a book called Moscow Trials as Evidence. I have not read the book. I will check it out someday, probably. However, his book is called Moscow Trials as Evidence, and I have read all the trial materials, all the trial transcripts, and they indeed provide fascinating information. And mostly I will be talking about that in this video. But I will also be referring to outside sources. Anti-communist propaganda typically characterizes the Moscow trials as some kind of a fraud or some kind of frame-up or hoax. But I would say that the vast majority of people who do that, who dismiss the Moscow trials as some kind of hoax, they've never actually read any of the trial material. Probably they've never looked into any of the other materials or evidence either, but they certainly haven't read the actual trial material. It's all available, so I'll put sources in the description where you can read it. It is also possible that some people have read the trial materials, but they're simply not knowledgeable enough about the context to be able to understand the trial material, even if they do read it. The trial materials themselves are not difficult to understand, but if one is a. ignorant of the context, and b. has a very strong anti-communist bias, then they might conclude that if there is something that they don't understand, or something which seems strange or far-fetched, then it must be fraudulent. Now, of course, what people find strange and what people find far-fetched, that is, of course, pretty relative. It depends on the person. A lot of people make this argument that, oh, it's unbelievable, therefore it must be false. But that's not a valid argument. Just because you think something is unbelievable or something seems far-fetched to you, that doesn't mean that it's false. In actuality, however, the trial materials are absolutely believable. And I strongly recommend everyone interested in the topic to actually read the trial materials. Almost everything in the trial materials can be verified and has been verified by independent outside evidence, or has a very logical and rational explanation, if one is not too blinded by bias. As a result, the trials actually seem completely legitimate and truthful. Of course, there are some details which are questionable. At every trial, defendants will always try to lie about certain things. They will forget certain things, they will get details wrong, etc. This only further makes the trials more credible, because if there actually were absolutely zero contradictions, or so to say, zero mistakes at the trial, then that actually would suggest that the whole thing has been somehow scripted or orchestrated. So let's talk about why might someone believe that the trials were frauds or hoaxes. And what people usually mean by fraud or hoax is that they mean that the accusations at the trials were not true, that the people who confessed to certain things, they confessed to things that they didn't actually do. Why that may be is, of course, up to debate. Some people claim that the defendants were threatened, that they were tortured or beaten, that they were deceived, that they were played by actors, that they were hypnotized, or that they were drugged, or whatever. There's all these various explanations. 
So why might somebody believe that they were frauds? Because that in and of itself seems quite far-fetched, especially since there's no real evidence for it. Well, first of all, one, the accusations made at the trials seem extraordinary, at least if one is not very familiar with the context or the motives and reasoning of the defendants. For those who are familiar with the defendant's track record, however, their views and their methods, the trial findings actually seem like a natural outcome of their past careers, and is basically only an escalation and stepping up a notch of the activity that the defendants were already doing in the past. For almost every accusation at the trial, there is precedent in the well-known past careers of the defendants. Defendants such as uh, Zinoviev, Kaminev, Buharin, Rykov, Tomsky, and of course also Trotsky, even though Trotsky was tried in absentia because he was uh, not inside the country. The more you know about the defendants and the facts surrounding the case, the more obvious their guilt actually seems like. But in any case, the crimes that they were accused of, such as treason, espionage, terrorism, conspiring with the hostile foreign states, etc., are not ordinary everyday crimes. So, while the accusations actually do seem believable and credible, I'm not trying to say that it was just an ordinary everyday type of thing. Of course, it was still like a pretty extraordinary thing. Reason two, why some people might think that it was a hoax, Many people think that the defendants were so-called old Bolsheviks and would not commit crimes like that. Countless people have dismissed the trials on these grounds alone. They say, oh, Trotsky and Buharin, they were these great revolutionaries, they would never betray the Soviet Union, they would never use terrorism, they would never do this, they would never do that, they would never conspire together with capitalist states. So they just say, oh, uh, Trotsky wouldn't do that. But... That is an argument entirely based on ignorance. Firstly, the status of the defendants as so-called old Bolsheviks is dubious at best. All the famous defendants, so Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Buharin, Radek, Rykov, Ayan Smirnov, they had all committed various acts of treachery against the Bolshevik leader Lenin, had been in opposition against Lenin on countless occasions for many years, or even the majority of their careers had opposed Lenin and Bolshevism in countless different ways. So the claim that, oh, there were just these great old Bolsheviks, they wouldn't do this, is not really credible. They had been fighting against Bolshevism their whole lives. They had committed acts of treason their whole careers. Secondly, many of the defendants had engaged in acts very similar to those accused at the trial already in the past, but usually, though not always, in less severe forms. And I will talk about that more in a bit. If one imagines the defendants as supposed old Bolsheviks and as some kind of revolutionary saints who had always been nothing but loyal and had never engaged in anything like that in the past, and if the crimes had been completely unprecedented, unheard of, and come entirely out of the blue, then yeah, it would seem quite unbelievable. However, the opposite is actually the case. The defendants were a group of lifelong oppositionists and lifelong professional underground conspirators with a long track record of similar acts. It's just that people are usually not aware of that. People don't know that for the vast majority of his career, Trotsky opposed Bolshevism and opposed Lenin, and that even after Trotsky joined the Bolshevik party, he was mostly in opposition against Lenin. People don't know that Zinoviev and Kamenev opposed the October Revolution. People don't know that Buharin was mostly in opposition against Lenin his whole career, that Buharin, just like Trotsky, was one of the biggest opposition leaders. In fact, Buharin was the head of the left communist opposition against Lenin, and then later he was the head of the right opposition against Stalin. Actually, Stalin and all his closest associates were also old Bolsheviks. So if the argument is that supposedly old Bolsheviks would never do anything wrong or would never do anything terrible, then I guess we have to conclude that Stalin must have been entirely correct because he was an old Bolshevik and all his buddies were also old Bolsheviks. The only difference is that Stalin and his associates were actually old Bolsheviks in substance and not only in name. Stalin and his associates were practically never in opposition against Lenin, never betrayed Lenin. And also, I have a blog post about this whole idea of um, the opposition leaders being old Bolsheviks 
I'll post that in the description as well, because I show that all the opposition leaders, such as uh, Buharin and Trotsky, they were never really old Bolsheviks in any serious way. Trotsky obviously joined the party very late, so he wasn't an old Bolshevik. Uh, Buharin, I think, only joined the party in 1913, so he had only been in the party a few years when the revolution happened. And even most of that time, he had been in opposition against Lenin already by that point. So he's not really an old Bolshevik. Zinoviev could be argued was an old Bolshevik, but he was also like a complete treacherous person and somebody who opposed Lenin. Whereas Stalin and his associates, uh, they actually were old Bolsheviks. Reason three why some people think that the Moscow trials were a fake or a frame-up is that many people claim that the defendants would not unite with fascists or with uh, enemies of the USSR, en enemies of the Stalin government, etc., and would not use acts of terrorism and acts of assassination and those kinds of things. Why? Because those positions are seen as un-Marxist. So people say uh, the oppositionists, such as Trotsky and Buharin, well, they claim to be Marxist, and because it would seem very weird for a Marxist to advocate for terrorism or to unite with all enemies of the Soviet Union, such as like Western imperialists and uh, even Nazis and fascists and nationalists, Therefore, people don't believe it. But this is also based on ignorance and nothing else. The fact is that all the defendants rationalized everything they did based on their own, albeit twisted version of Marxism. From the point of view of their worldview and their program, it all actually makes absolute logical sense. Of course, their plan was still overtly risky, adventurist, and unlikely to succeed. However, the plans of the left opposition and the Trotskyist opposition were always, even in the past, notorious for being adventurous, extremely risky, overtly hasty, aggressive, and quite frankly, stupid plans, more like frenzied utopias of fanatics rather than realistic and scientific plans. And I'm speaking in broad generalities, but I'll get more into the details later. The opposition, which the defendants belonged to for most of their careers, was also extremely well known for flip-flopping on every conceivable position. To mention only some examples, Buharin went from being the leader of the left opposition to being the leader of the right opposition, went from being one of the main supporters of extremist, extremely left policies during the civil war to supporting the opposite policies only a couple years later. Trotsky, on the other hand, had changed all his positions so many times that Lenin famously said, quote, Trotsky, however, has never had any physiognomy at all, the only thing he does have is a habit of changing sides, unquote. That's what Lenin says in uh, the breakup of the August bloc. Trotsky had flip-flopped between various kinds of anti-Bolshevism for more than a decade until he finally joined the Bolsheviks in 1917. This is what Lenin said in his article called The Historical Meaning of the Inner Party Struggle in Russia. He says, quote, Trotsky, on the other hand, represents only his personal vacillations and nothing more. In 1903 he was Menshevik, he abandoned Menshevism in 1904, returned to the Mensheviks in 1905 and merely flaunted ultra-revolutionary phrases. In 1906 he left them again, at the end of 1906 he advocated electoral agreement with the cadets, who were basically liberal capitalists, that is, he was in fact once more with the Mensheviks, and in the spring of 1907 at the London Congress he said that he differed from Rosa Luxemburg on individual shades of ideas rather than on political tendencies. One day, Trotsky plagiarizes from the ideological stock in trade of one faction, the next day he plagiarizes from that of another." Unquote. And keep in mind that when Lenin made that statement, Trotsky hadn't even created the August Bloc yet, which was his completely ridiculous attempt to unite all anti-Leninist factions into one coalition. So Trotsky had flip-flopped between various kinds of anti-Bolshevism for more than a decade, until he finally joined the Bolsheviks in 1917. Right before joining the Bolsheviks, Trotsky had said at a conference of his own group, quote, I cannot be called a Bolshevik, we must not be demanded to recognize Bolshevism, unquote. You know what happened after that? Well, they did recognize Bolshevism and then they joined the Bolsheviks and since then Trotsky always claimed to be a Bolshevik. So he was never very consistent. After joining the Bolsheviks, Trotsky then almost immediately went into opposition against Lenin inside the Bolshevik party. By 1927, he had been expelled from the party and was advocating his own Trotskyist theories again, 
which strongly differed from the line of the party and were entirely his own concoctions. So to expect some kind of Leninist orthodoxy from Trotsky and his supporters or these other people such as Buharin is not logical. Therefore, the argument that the defendants would not do X because they would think that it's un-Marxist or un-Bolshevik is simply not accurate. They supported one position one day and the opposite position the next day, and always they justified it by appealing to Marxism or even to Bolshevism. Back in the day, the Trotskyists, the Bukharinists and company believed that they were the ones creating Marxism, or at least creating some kind of new kind of modern Marxism. Trotsky and Buharin considered themselves to be theoreticians and authorities on Marxist ideology practically on the same level as Lenin, and certainly they considered themselves to be above everybody else other than Lenin. It's actually pretty interesting how Marxist-Leninists describe Stalin in relation to Lenin, is that they always say that Stalin followed Lenin's ideas and supported Lenin's ideas, but how Trotskyists describe Trotsky and Lenin is they say that Trotsky was always teaching Lenin. That Trotsky had all these cool theories and Lenin supposedly accepted them in the end even though he never actually did. But Trotskyists claim that actually Lenin learned from Trotsky and just adopted his positions. And this bourgeois historian, this uh, anti-communist historian who is uh, famous for his book on Buharin, he also always claims that Buharin was just teaching Lenin, that Lenin always was proven wrong by Buharin and then Lenin was always forced to just accept Buharin's positions, which is just lunacy. That never happened. But uh, that is what some people claim. According to Marxism-Leninism, the world had entered a new stage of capitalism, imperialism, and therefore new theories were needed. Trotskyists and Buharinists agreed about this. They agreed that new theories were needed, but the theories that they proposed were just entirely different from Marxism-Leninism. They thought that if Lenin, and certainly if Stalin, can develop new theories, then why couldn't they? So the idea that, oh, this just goes against Marxism, therefore they wouldn't do this, that's not really how these people thought, that doesn't really hold up. There are even some subtle signs that their view on terrorism was changing, even though, yes, it would be very difficult to advocate terrorism from a Marxist position, but you can even see little hints that they were going in that direction, in my opinion. Because even though Trotsky and Buharin almost always supported terrorism only secretly, but even in his public writings, Trotsky argued that quote-unquote Stalinism had entered into a stage of quote-unquote bureaucracy, which made terrorism inevitable and practically justifiable. Though he doesn't say it quite as bluntly as that, that's basically what he means. He says, quote, the discontent is spreading within the masses of the people, for which the means of proper expression and an outlet are lacking. If the youth itself feels that it is spurned, oppressed, and deprived of the chance for independent development, the atmosphere for terroristic groupings is created. Unquote. He basically just excuses it. He says that this is the bureaucracy's fault. And like I said, Trotsky and Buharin, they did support terrorism mostly secretly, and I will show examples later, but I'm just saying that even in public, texts, their view on terrorism was a bit weird. Trotsky had a track record of not stating his actual positions openly. For example, during the brest crisis in 1918, he did not have the courage to join the left communist opposition openly and to advocate for a supposed red holy war, which was uh, left opposition's terminology. Instead, Trotsky advocated a slogan that he called neither peace nor war, which in practice, in reality, opposed Lenin's demand to sign an immediate peace treaty, and it actually in practice supported the left communist position of not signing the peace treaty, but Trotsky still didn't openly embrace the Red Holy War idea. I think the reason for that is that Trotsky had only joined the party one year earlier, so I think that's why he didn't have the courage to immediately take an extreme anti-Lenin position. So instead, when the left communist said, no peace, Trotsky also said, no peace but then he added a little caveat, also no war, but still don't sign the peace treaty. So he tried to make it seem like he was taking a middle position, but actually he was supporting the position of the left communists. Because it doesn't really matter why you don't sign the peace treaty, it only matters that you don't sign it. You either sign it or you don't. There's not really a neutral position between those. Buharin and the left opposition had also in the past collaborated with the left SR party, who actually completely openly supported and used terrorism. 
The left SR party had also advocated an attempted a coup d'état in 1918 against the Bolshevik government, which the left opposition did not oppose in principle. Which again, seems like, I mean, if these people are working with the left SRs who are trying to overthrow the Bolshevik government, then immediately they seem sketchy and they seem traitorous, but people just usually either dismiss that and claim that that didn't happen, or they are just not aware of it. Buharin himself admitted this already in the 1920s, long before he was ever put on trial. So Buharin wrote in Pravda, January 3rd, 1924, quote, I consider it my party duty to tell about the proposal made by the left socialist revolutionaries at a moment of bitter factional struggle, so as to paralyze that idyllic varnish of the events of the Brest period which has been practiced by the comrades of the opposition, unquote. What he means by that is that by this point he had already split with the left opposition and he had basically taken a rightist position and the people in the left opposition and the Trotskyist opposition, they claimed that actually the Brest period was great but now Buharin disagrees with them and he says actually the Brest period was very bad and then as an example he says guys, don't you remember the coup that the left SRs tried to carry out against the Bolshevik government? Don't you remember when they tried to kill Lenin? And don't you remember when uh, the left opposition actually was kind of in cahoots with them? So that's what he means. This is what Stephen Cohen writes about this uh, article by Buharin. He says, quote, When the opposition pointedly compared current norms with the free discussion during the Brest controversy, Buharin tried to discredit the earlier period by disclosing that Lenin's arrest had been discussed by left communists and the left socialist revolutionaries in 1918, and asserting that it had been a period when the party stood a hair from a split and the whole country a hair from ruin, So in 1924, Buharin actually revealed that the left communist group, which he was the leader of, and the left SRs had actually discussed not only a coup against the Bolshevik government, but also arresting Lenin, and also actually of murdering Lenin, but Buharin didn't admit that at the time. When the coup actually started, the left SRs assassinated the German ambassador to uh, the USSR in order to provoke a war between Germany and the USSR to basically sabotage the brest peace treaty. And then they also tried to carry out an assassination attempt against Lenin. But despite being shot in the neck, Lenin just uh, didn't die, so it failed. So those were the people that the left communist opposition was in cahoots with. Now, somebody might ask, didn't the Bolshevik party of Lenin also have a brief alliance with the left SRs during the October Revolution? Yes, they did, but in those days the left SR party was not the same. The left SR party was a wavering, petty bourgeois, utopian socialist party, which included many different elements. Only the terroristic and reactionary elements joined together with the right SRs and Bukharinist left communists. All the best elements of the left SR party opposed the reactionary coup. The left communists want to collaborate with the left SRs, and even half the left SRs think that, man, that's just way too reactionary, we're not going to go along with that. So the left SRs then split into three groups. The remaining left SRs, who are a bunch of anti-Soviet terrorists, and then the two other groups that split from them, the Narodnik communists and the revolutionary communists, both of which soon just dissolved themselves and simply joined the Bolshevik party. Zinoviev and Kamenev also had cultivated terroristic views among their supporters, which they admitted in 1935. That was actually the original accusation. They were only accused of cultivating terroristic views among their supporters, because the person who actually committed the assassination of Sergei Kirov was a Zinoviev supporter. I could also give other examples of... uh, Zinoviev supporters who carried out assassinations, but I can't really go into that because it would just simply take too long. But in any case, Zinoviev and Kamenev admitted that, and uh, they claimed that, uh, oh, well, yeah, we're sorry, we self-criticize, etc., etc., but obviously they weren't earnestly changing. It is also often argued that Trotsky would find fascists and other capitalists so repugnant that he would never work with them, but in reality, Trotsky was a calculating politician who was willing to work with any enemy of his enemy, that is, any enemy of Stalin. In Trotsky's mind, he was not really helping the fascists, and he was not really helping the capitalists, at least not in the long run. But instead, Trotsky believed that he was playing the fascists and Stalin against each other, and Trotsky imagined that then he would be the true beneficiary, that he would play these against each other and he would come out on top. And Trotsky actually had a long history of doing this. 
In exile from the USSR, Trotsky was living on money provided to him by capitalists. He wanted to get political asylum in the USA, and he was willing to provide the US Secret Services information about communists and the USSR in exchange for that. The USA actually declined to give Trotsky asylum, but instead they still kept in touch with him, assisting him, while Trotsky got asylum in Mexico on the other side of the border. This has been revealed in documents released since the 1990s. Now, let's finally take a look at the trials themselves. There are several particular points that I want to comment on. So firstly, the zinoviev kamenev trial of 1936. I cannot give a full explanation here of the trials or what the opposition was trying to do. You should watch my video trilogy on the trials first if you want to know about all the details. But basically, one and a half years earlier, the Leningrad party secretary Sergei Kirov had been assassinated by somebody who was a member of the Communist Party and part of the Zinovievite opposition. And eventually, Zinoviev and Kamenev were accused of first creating such hostility among their supporters against leaders of the party that one of those guys actually killed a party leader, and then finally of actually ordering and planning the killing. They were also accused of working with enemies of the Soviet Union, such as hostile foreign states. They think that they can't overthrow the Soviet government under normal conditions, but if there is a massive war, then they can do it. And as a result, they felt that they need to negotiate with foreign capitalist states so that when the foreign capitalist states invade the Soviet Union and the oppositionists come to power, the oppositionists can just say like, hey, remember, we already had a negotiation beforehand. We already agreed that we're going to have policies which are suitable for you and favorable for you. So so we can just now sign a peace treaty which ends this war and is very favorable to you, and we also get to stay in power. Does that seem like a realistic plan? Well, kinda. The October Revolution happened during World War I, so the oppositionists thought that during World War II maybe they could carry out a revolution. Lenin signed the peace treaty with Germany, which basically ended Russia's involvement in World War I. The treaty was very harsh for Russia, but Russia simply didn't have a choice, because otherwise Germany would have just conquered even more. So the oppositionists thought, we'll just do the same thing. We'll sign a peace treaty, we'll give a bunch of stuff to the uh, invaders. If that's what is necessary, then we'll do it. Of course, their attempt to justify this by saying that, well, this is what Lenin also did, so we thought we would do that. The court actually thought that that's pure slander. Which, of course, is true because, of course, Lenin was overthrowing the Tsarist government. He wasn't overthrowing a Soviet government. Lenin wasn't helping any imperialist power. Lenin wasn't in cahoots with the foreign invaders, etc., etc. So at the trial, the Zinovievite opposition was accused of uh, killing Sergei Kirov and also planning to murder Stalin and also a lot of other party leaders. But why Kirov? That's what I want to talk about. Well, Kirov was the Leningrad party secretary. And previously, Zinoviev had been the Leningrad party secretary. So Kirov had actually replaced Zinoviev and then he had basically decimated the Zinovievite organization and replaced it with his own guys who Zinoviev considered to be Stalinist. So that's already a good reason to want Kirov out of the picture. And that's also probably why all these Zinoviev supporters in Leningrad had uh, completely genuine hatred for Kirov. But also the Zinovievites believed that they could also kill Stalin but that after Stalin's death, there would then inevitably emerge, of course, a power struggle, and then Kirov would probably be the guy who would win it. So therefore, it was necessary to also kill Kirov, and also probably kill all the other top Stalinists as well. Because even if they did kill Stalin, that still wouldn't mean that Zinoviev would become the party leader. No, probably just Kirov would be the party leader. So let's first take him out. A counter-revolutionary terrorist named Grigory Tokayev has actually independently corroborated this in his own memoirs written after his defection to the West. In his memoirs, Tokayev admitted to belonging to a, quote, opposition group, which had been forced to contemplate acts of political terror against both Kirov and Kalinin. Kirov was shot by yet another underground group, unquote. And this uh, other underground group, which actually carried out the assassination, was the Zinoviev group. Tokayev was in contact and was familiar with these other terroristic groups. He wrote in his memoirs, quote, 
there had already been no less than 15 attempts to assassinate Stalin. None had got near to success. Each had cost many brave lives. Unquote. Buharin's colleague named Humber Rose, who later became an anti-communist, has also verified that the right opposition was planning to form a coalition in order to murder Stalin. This is what Humbert Rose writes. Quote, I went to see Buharin. He brought me up to date with the contacts made by his group with the Zinoviev Kamine fraction in order to coordinate the struggle against the power of Stalin. Buharin also told me that they had decided to use individual terror in order to rid themselves of Stalin. Unquote. And what that means is assassination. At their trial, Zinoviev and Kamenev were accused of plotting to organize the arrest and killing of the entire so-called Stalinist leadership at the 17th Party Congress. This is also corroborated by Tokayev, who wrote, quote, In 1934, there was a plot to start a revolution by arresting the whole of the Stalinist pact, 17th Congress of the Party, unquote. Zinovievites and Trotskyists had formed a united bloc in 1932, which also included many other groupings, including right oppositionists. However, nothing about that was mentioned at the trial of Zinoviev and Kamenev in 1936. This will be an important piece of information to keep in mind. Now, some might claim that Zinoviev and Kamenev were actually honest and always spoke the truth, and that their denials of guilt were always truthful. But they had already been put on trial in 1935, where they admitted moral guilt for Kirov's murder, as they had cultivated anti-party and terroristic views among their supporters, and the murderer of Kirov had actually been a Zinoviev supporter. However, at the 1935 trial, not only did Zinoviev and Kamenev not reveal that they had actually planned the murder, and not simply indirectly inspired it, but they also kept secret all their contacts with the Trotskyists and Buharinists, and they concealed the existence of the entire block of rights and Trotskyites, which had been formed in 1932, as documents now prove. They continued to try to hide the existence of the block at their second trial in 1936. So when people claim that, oh, Zinoviev and Kamenev must have been speaking the truth, well, clearly... The bloc of rights and Trotskyites existed, and they never admitted it. They never said anything about it. This is one of the documents that was discovered at the Harvard Trotsky Archive in the 1980s, actually by a Trotskyist historian. So, if anything, the Trotskyist historian in question, named Pierre Bruet, he cannot be accused of being biased against Trotsky, if anything, it's very possible that uh, he covered up the true extent of what Trotsky was actually doing. But this is what the document says. So this is a letter from Trotsky's son to Trotsky. It talks about the creation of the United Bloc of Rights and Trotskyites. It says, quote, The bloc is organized. It includes the Zinovievists, the Sten Laminatze group, and the Trotskyists, in parentheses, former capitulators. The Safar Tarkhan group have not yet formally entered. They have too extreme a position they will enter very soon. And then it uh, also mentions some of the other familiar names. So it says uh, the I.N. Smirnov group and uh, Priyabrzhinsky, unquote. I.N. Smirnov and Priyabrzhinsky were both uh, famous Trotskyists in the Soviet Union. Priyabrzhinsky was uh, one of the leading theoreticians of the left opposition and then the Trotskyist group. Now let's talk about the next trial. So that's the Radek Pyatakov trial of 1937. The first trial was called the trial of the Leningrad Center, basically the trial of the Zinovievite organization in Leningrad. The second trial is known as the trial of the uh, Moscow Center, also known as the Parallel Center, because um, apparently the Radek Pyatakov group was originally not super active, but after the Zinovievites were smashed, that's when they became active, because um, they were supposed to be like a backup parallel group, and they weren't supposed to activate themselves and, uh, and put themselves in danger if it wasn't necessary. So at this trial of the famous Trotskyist Radek and the famous left communist and left oppositionist Pyotakov, the motivations and program of the Trotskyite Zinovievite United Opposition is explained in great detail. So Trotsky had claimed that building of socialism in one country was impossible and that the Soviet industrialization would inevitably fail. 
Due to challenges and hardships in the struggle to industrialize, many of the oppositionists had accepted Trotsky's views in 1938 to 1933, so they thought maybe Trotsky is right, maybe it is impossible to industrialize and build socialism. The position of the right opposition was also that rapid industrialization and building of socialism were impossible. They found common ground with the Trotskyites. Pyatakov was a close colleague of Buharin. Buharin was now the head of the right opposition and had been previously the head of the left communist opposition, and Pyatakov had also been one of the leaders of the left communist opposition. So the different oppositions were closely connected. When the danger of a second world war increased, Trotsky argued that the USSR would inevitably lose the war to Japan and Germany. This position was accepted by many oppositionists in the mid-1930s. So here's something Trotsky wrote, quote, Only the overthrow of the Bonapartist Kremlin clique can make possible the regeneration of the military strength of the USSR. The struggle against war, imperialism and fascism demands a ruthless struggle against Stalinism splotched with crimes. Whoever defends Stalinism directly or indirectly, whoever keeps silent about its betrayals or exaggerates its military strength, is the worst enemy of the revolution. Unquote. So just like with the Clemenceau thesis, he's saying that only the overthrow of the Soviet government can regenerate the military strength of the USSR and thus allow them to win, otherwise they wouldn't win a war. And he's saying that nobody should exaggerate the military strength of the USSR, otherwise you are the worst enemy of the revolution. And then in another text, Trotsky stated that Stalin fears the coming war because he knows that it's going to lead to his overthrow, supposedly. Quote, the Soviet bureaucracy fears a great war more than any ruling class in the world. It has little to win, but everything to lose. The Moscow bureaucracy itself will be thrown into an abyss before the revolution comes in the capitalist countries. Unquote. At the trial, Trotsky's Radek explained that since they believed that the USSR would not be able to win the war, it was necessary to make agreements with foreign powers, UK, Poland, and mainly Japan and Germany, to make compromises. When those foreign powers attacked the USSR, the oppositionists would take power, and they would already have agreements with those foreign powers. Those agreements would then grant the foreign powers all kinds of concessions. They would get territory, favorable trade deals, the ability to invest in the USSR, as had been done during the NEP, etc. The opposition believed that these concessions would save the USSR from disaster, and were also totally in line with the rest of their program. So it's pretty interesting. The Trotskyists, they believed that it was impossible to build socialism in one country and that the five-year plan would surely fail and that the USSR would definitely lose the war. The right opposition believed that in principle it was possible to build socialism in one country, but in actual practice the industrialization that was happening was not possible because the USSR was too poor. So they thought that the USSR needs to very slowly just develop capitalism over several decades. So despite having some differences of opinion, basically the Trotskyist opposition and the right opposition both agreed that what they need to do is restore the NEP, which is quite strange because Trotsky, of course, originally opposed the NEP, but, you know, Trotsky was never very consistent. So they thought that they need to restore the NEP, which basically means restoring capitalism, and that they actually need to deregulate the economy even more than was the case originally under the NEP make compromises with uh, the capitalist class, mainly the Kula class, and they need to allow foreign investments, which were called concessions. People who ran foreign investments in the Soviet Union during the NEP were called concessionaires. And as a result, they could also make agreements with all these foreign states, say, hey, if we come to power, we'll let you invest in the USSR, we'll let you exploit Soviet workers, we'll let you exploit Soviet uh, mineral resources. You can understand what they were trying to go for. Some people might say that this sounds unbelievable because the left opposition had previously been so against the NEP, but I don't think it's so surprising that they changed their mind, and it's not even necessarily particularly dishonest or unprincipled that they changed their mind, because I think they realized that war communism, which had been their previous position, was simply not applicable anymore. Their position on war communism had largely been... uh, based on the idea that there would be a European revolution or a world revolution in the near future, and the European revolution of 1917 to 1923 had already ended long ago, so the situation was now completely different. 
it wouldn't make any sense for them to advocate for the return of war communism anymore. According to the oppositionists, because the USSR's defeat in a future war was considered inevitable, the correct position was revolutionary defeatism. So what does that mean? It means that because they thought that the USSR would definitely lose when these foreign states invade, this means that they basically had to take that as their starting point. So since the USSR is going to lose, how should we take that into account? Well, they said, let's make agreements with foreign states and uh, let's hasten the defeat by intentionally sabotaging the defensive capacity of the USSR. And this is a twisted version of Lenin's revolutionary defeatism and turning imperialist war into civil war. There actually already was a precedent for this. In the 1920s, Trotsky had already advocated the so-called Clemenceau thesis, which claimed that while the USSR was threatened by invading enemy armies and by capitalist encirclement, it was actually necessary to overthrow the Soviet government and thus save the country, supposedly. So this is what Trotsky wrote in 1927. Quote, What is defeatism? A policy which pursues the aim of facilitating the defeat of one's own state, which is in the hands of a hostile class. Any other conception and interpretation of defeatism will be a falsification. Thus, for example, if someone says that the political line of ignorant and dishonest cribbers must be swept away like garbage precisely in the interests of the victory of the worker state, that does not make him a defeatist. On the contrary, under the given concrete conditions, he is thereby giving genuine expression to revolutionary defensism. Ideological garbage does not lead to victory." Unquote. So what Trotsky is there saying is he's defending himself against this accusation. He's, he's saying that he's actually not a defeatist because in order to be a defeatist, you would have to oppose a different class. And he's saying that since he's calling for the overthrow of the Soviet government, which is actually the same class as he is, therefore it's wrong to call him a defeatist. But I mean, I think that's sophistry. Like he's calling for the defeat of the Soviet government. And Trotsky continues. He says, quote, examples and very instructive ones could be found in the history of other classes. We shall quote only one. At the beginning of the imperialist war, the French bourgeoisie had at its head a government without a sail or rudder. The Clemenceau group was in opposition to that government, notwithstanding the war and the military censorship, notwithstanding even the fact that the Germans were 80 kilometers from Paris. Clemenceau said, precisely because of it, he conducted a fierce struggle against petty bourgeois flabbiness and irresolution and for imperialist ferocity and ruthlessness. Clemenceau was not a traitor to his class, the bourgeoisie. On the contrary, he served it more loyally, more resolutely and more shrewdly than Viviani, Painlev and company. The subsequent course of events proved that the Clemenceau group came into power and its more consistent, more predatory imperialist policy ensured victory for the French bourgeoisie. Were there any French newspapermen that called the Clemenceau group defeatists? There must have been fools and slanderers following the train of every class. They do not, however, always have the opportunity to play an equally important role." Unquote. So again, Trotsky is trying to defend himself from the accusation of being a defeatist, and he's saying that the bourgeois imperialist Clemenceau carried out a coup against his own government when they were threatened by a foreign invading army, but that that doesn't actually make him a traitor or a defeatist of any kind, that actually that was a correct thing to do, and that that way he saved the state. And even though Trotsky doesn't say that in this particular text, Trotsky's point was that just like Clemenceau was in the opposition, Trotsky is also in the opposition, and that just like France was threatened by foreign invading armies, the Soviet Union is threatened by foreign invading armies, and their government is supposedly very bad, so the opposition needs to overthrow the government in order to save the country. So that's what Trotsky also wants to do. This is from an article that Trotsky wrote called The Clemenceau Thesis and the Party Regime, where he also tries to defend himself. He says, quote, The Clemenceau example, the example from the political experience of a class inimical to us, was used by me to illustrate a solitary and very simple idea. The ruling class, in the guise of its leading vanguard, must preserve its capacity to reform its ranks under the most difficult conditions." Unquote. And by reforming party ranks, Trotsky here means overthrowing Stalin and abolishing the so-called Stalinist bureaucracy, which uh, allegedly prevented the proper functioning and reforming the party. 
He was already calling for the overthrow of the Soviet government by the opposition based on really weird reasoning, and they kept that position in the 1930s. So then, when Trotsky was exiled in 1927, Radek refused to go with him, and this resulted in a split between the two. Some might argue that since Radek split with Trotsky, the charge that he returned to Trotskyism was a fabrication. However, Zinoviev also split with Trotsky in 1927, and Trotsky was very bitter about it. But despite of that, documents from the Harvard Trotsky archive prove that Zinoviev did join with Trotsky again in 1932, and even in these documents, Trotsky makes bitter remarks against the so-called capitulators and ex-Trotskyists. Those capitulators were Zinoviev and Kamenev mainly, and the ex-Trotskyists were people like Radek, who did not agree to emigrate with Trotsky. So Trotsky was still mad at them, but they still all united into a common bloc in 1932. Radek explains that his betrayal against the party and his rejoining the Trotskyists took place because he still remained friends with many ex-Trotskyists, who had stayed in the USSR and not emigrated with Trotsky, but who still adopted the Trotskyist position again as soon as the difficulties and hard class struggle of 1928-33 to began. Radek explained that he would always hang out with Trotskyists, hear them attacking the party's policies and the government's policies, and that he would never say or do anything to stop them. Thus, he was already one foot in Trotskyism. Gradually, he joined in their group, and finally was uh, officially asked to join through a letter that uh, Trotsky sent. Radek explains his personal motives for joining and then later abandoning the Trotskyists. He said that he fully believed that the defeat of the USSR in war was inevitable, and as a result, he supported the defeatist position, which was for him the only possible position. Because, I mean, if they think the defeat is inevitable, then you can either do nothing, or you can try to somehow take advantage of that, which that's what they tried to do. Now, this position, again, might sound crazy to any sane person, but Trotsky had already advocated a similar position previously, and the left communist had also previously made statements, saying that in the interests of world revolution, it was acceptable to sacrifice Soviet power, to sacrifice the USSR to a defeat in war. A left communist text from 1918 said, quote, in the interest of the world revolution, we consider it expedient to accept the possibility of losing Soviet power, which is now becoming purely formal, unquote. And this is uh, quoted in uh, Lenin's article called Strange and Monstrous. Lenin described the left communist position as strange and monstrous. However, according to Radek, as the industrialization actually was proceeding, he started to believe that the USSR actually might be able to win the war after all. This, in his own words, meant that the Trotskyist program was not based on reality, not in accordance with real facts. This is why he began distancing himself from the Trotskyists, not because of any love for Stalin or any particular loyalty to the USSR, only because of purely tactical calculations. Radek's testimony is completely believable. It actually would be very hard to believe anything else. The entire plan flows completely inevitably from the logic of Trotsky's position. Any other outcome is pretty much impossible. What else could they do? Based on Trotsky's theory, could they possibly believe that socialism in one country can be built and that somehow Stalin's plans are all going to work? No, of course not. Of course they're going to think the opposite. They're going to think that everything is going to go horribly wrong for Stalin. And this is also what the right opposition believed, and they were in agreement with those guys. The trial of Radek and Pyotrkov features countless moments which testify to its authenticity and truthfulness. For example, the questioning of the German engineer. The court has this very unnecessary and awkward interaction with the engineer regarding whether he needs an interpreter or not. It goes to show that this is a real court with real people and that it was not scripted because it doesn't serve any kind of uh, propagandistic purpose. Same goes for the testimony of the international vagabond and general weirdo named Arnold, who also had countless other aliases. Arnold is a very small character in the whole plot, he's not a big, famous person, but his whole convoluted story takes an extremely long time to get straight. If a scriptwriter had manufactured the whole thing, he probably would have cut that whole thing out. The opposition united with all the enemies of the Stalin government, so all opposition groups, 
including Mensheviks, nationalists, anti-communists, the so-called SR terrorists. And this is not unusual, because as we know from documents discovered in the Harbor Trotsky archive, Trotsky had supported forming a bloc or a coalition with countless opposition groups, and also in his past, Trotsky had united with basically all anti-Leninist groups of all shades in the so-called August Bloc. And the August Bloc was a real, basically, clusterfuck, because it included groups which had nothing in common with each other except that they just uh, hated Leninism. And the left communists also had united with the left SRs and right SR parties, which were both anti-communist parties and held views that strongly contradicted with left communist and Trotskyist ideology on numerous important points, but that didn't stop them from uniting with those guys. At this trial, there still was no mention of the involvement of the right opposition at all, although they had entered into the united bloc with the Trotskyites and Zinoviavites and left communists since 1932, and, in fact, the right opposition and the Zinoviev opposition had already had, uh, basically, joint plans since 1929. But even then, nothing was mentioned about the right opposition at this trial, and no charges were brought against any members of the right opposition at this trial. Keep this in mind when we get to the next section. The leader of the right opposition, Buharin, was mentioned a couple times, but only in passing, because people said that uh, Buharin had been with Pyotrkov when certain events had taken place. No conclusions were drawn from this, it's just that, well, Pyotrkov and Buharin, they, they were close, so Buharin just happened to be there when something happened. No charges were brought against Buharin, and he was not connected to any of the crimes in any way. The oppositionist views that Buharin had advocated in the past, together with Pyotrkov, basically in 1918, 1919, etc., and also his views in 1928 to 1930 were mentioned, but it was assumed that his participation in any of the oppositions had ended. The other leader of the right opposition, Tomsky, was also mentioned briefly, but again, he wasn't uh, connected to any of the criminal activities. Now, let's cover the last trial, so the buharin rykov trial of 1938. So eventually the police did start investigating Tomsky, because he was connected to this stuff. And when Tomsky realized that the police were on his trail, he committed suicide, and he left a note claiming that the previous chief of the Soviet security apparatus, or the NKVD, named Yagoda, was actually a secret member of the right opposition. When Yagoda was relieved of the leadership of the NKVD, basically due to incompetence, the connection of the right opposition to the Trotskyists and the Zinovievites were disclosed. And at this point it became clear that Yagoda had been hiding the fact that the right opposition and its leaders Buharin, Rykov and Tomsky were in a united bloc together with the other criminals. And all this has been verified countless times. So, it was super weird that the documents which proved the existence of the United Bloc of Rights and Trotskyites were from 1932, and the NKVD got them in 1934, but still, at the trial of Zinoviev in 1935 and 1936, that wasn't mentioned at all, it was never revealed. At the trial of Radek and Pyotrkov in 1937, it still wasn't revealed, it wasn't discussed at all, and this was all during the time when Yagoda was the head of the NKVD and NKVD had all the documents, but they didn't reveal them. It was only when Yagoda was removed that the information was revealed, like, hey, oh, look, the NKVD has had these documents for four years, which proved that the right opposition was connected to this. And we know that the right opposition was connected to this because, for instance, one of the documents from the Harvard Trotsky archive, which was actually discovered by historian J. Arch Getty, is a mailing receipt, which proves that letters were sent from Trotsky to Buharin. Those letters have been destroyed, so we don't actually know what those letters say. The people who controlled the Trotsky archive wanted us to not have access to those, I wonder why. Trotsky, of course, had always denied, he had always said that no, he, he's not talking to Buharin at all. And Buharin was also proven to have um, plotted the assassination of Stalin together with uh, Zinoviev. And those Trotsky documents, which still do remain, confirm the fact that Trotsky had a united bloc with Zinoviev. So they're all in cahoots with each other, it's not really a surprise. But the involvement of the right opposition was kept secret, because Yagoda was the head of the NKVD, and Yagoda was in fact a secret member of the right opposition. 
J. Arch Getty claims that Yagura wasn't really trying to help the terrorists, it's just that he was incompetent and he was trying to hide the fact that he was incompetent, so that's why he was covering up all of this, and that he had been in the right opposition in the past and he didn't want anybody to know that, so that's why he was trying to hide the involvement of the right opposition. But Getty has no evidence for that, he's just claiming that. In reality, it makes a lot more sense to believe that Yagoda was trying to help these terrorists. Because if the opposition is come to power, that's good for Yagoda. But if the opposition is get caught, that's very bad for Yagoda. Because that means that he probably also will get caught. His lies will be revealed. So Yagoda was replaced as the head of the NKVD by Nikolai Yezhov, who was also a secret member of the right opposition, but this was not revealed until even later. So the Yezhov connection was never discussed at any of the trials. At the trial, some of the defendants actually claimed that their plan was to murder Stalin and other high officials, just like they had murdered Kirov, and they also claimed that they had wanted to murder Yezhov as well. But this obviously cannot be true, because Yezhov himself was working together with the oppositionists. So there are two possible explanations. One, some of the defendants, low-level conspirators, must not have known that Yezhov was actually on their side, that Yezhov actually was a rightist. And it makes a lot of sense that Yezhov would have this kind of deep cover that he wouldn't reveal to these uh, low-level guys that he's actually an agent. So that makes a lot of sense. And the second possible explanation is that some of these guys, more higher-ranking conspirators, such as Buharin himself, for example, did know the truth about Yezhov, but they were trying to shield him by claiming that, oh no, Yezhov is not one of our guys, he's not on our side. Actually, we tried to kill him, he's, we, you know, he's not with us. In fact, uh, I don't remember where I read this, but... I do remember reading somewhere the speculation that Yeshov promised the right oppositionists that uh, if they don't reveal any information about him, he's going to make sure that they don't get the death penalty, which is certainly possible. And then, of course, when they do get the death penalty, well, that's also fine for Yeshov because they get killed and they can't snitch on him. At the trial, it became evident that even under normal conspiratorial conditions, the defendants did not usually know what other people in their organization were doing. This is normal basically for all underground organizations, so it makes sense. Trotsky and the other high-ranking members of the conspiracy did not even reveal their true program to most of their underlings. And they actually say that uh, this is because it wasn't possible for them to arrange any kind of Trotskyist congress or something, because they would probably all just be arrested and they would just be discovered, but also because they were afraid that it would cause a split, which makes a lot of sense because their tactics were sketchy as hell, and also they were pretty uh, prone to splitting even under the best of conditions. Yezhov was promoted to the head of the NKVD in order to investigate a series of mine explosions caused by sabotage, the Kemerovo mine explosions. It's possible, in my opinion, that the opposition orchestrated these explosions not only for the sake of sabotage, but also specifically to engineer Yezhov's rise to prominence. This I cannot prove, that's just my speculation but I think it's certainly possible. Yagoda had become the head of the NKVD by murdering the previous leader of the NKVD named Menjinsky, and the reason that Yezhov was uh, promoted to uh, replace Yagoda was because Yagoda had been uh, involved in this massive corruption scandal, and also the party was extremely unhappy with the functioning of the NKVD, so they wanted to bring in some new person who wasn't part of the police, so then they brought in Yezhov, who was in the party personnel department. At the Buharin trial, the so-called Ryutin platform was discussed. The Ryutin platform was an oppositional program from 1932, which claimed that Stalin had created a system of feudal exploitation of the peasantry, and the program demanded Stalin's violent overthrow. All the main points of this program were basically uh, eventually adopted by the right opposition, the left communists, and the Trotskyists. The Ryutin group itself was a rightist group. It was known that young supporters of Buharin had been involved in the Ryutin group. Buharin had admitted at a central committee meeting where he had been questioned that he had known about the existence of this group. He had not informed the party about this conspiratorial group, allegedly because he had tried to reason with the group and supposedly to persuade them to stop what they were doing. 
Later, however, Buharin admitted that he was part of the group himself and that his name had been left out of the program for the purposes of secrecy. However, he denied being the main architect of the program, even though he probably was. Historical facts fully corroborate the trial findings. The pro-Trotsky historian Pierre Brouet actually discovered documents from the Harvard Trotsky archive which verified that in 1932 Trotsky had ordered the creation of the United Bloc of Rights and Trotskyists. It also included the Zinoviavites, then Laminace group and others. These documents also mention the names of many of the most famous defendants at these trials, such as Priyabrzhinsky, Ayan Smirnov and Sokolnikov. The documents discovered by J.R. Getty also implicate Buharin. One of these documents discovered at the Harvard Trotsky archive, uh, the letter from Sedov to Trotsky, laments the arrest of the secret Trotskyist center and states that the loss of these old Trotskyist leaders is a serious defeat, but that they still have links to agents on the ground level. It says, quote, The collapse of the old men is a heavy blow, but the links with the workers have been preserved, unquote. In the Ryutin program, it says, quote, In the struggle to destroy Stalin's dictatorship, we must in the main rely not on the old leaders, unquote. So the old Trotskyist leaders get arrested, and the Ryutin program then says, Well, we can't rely on the old leaders. The Soviet communists had known that since 1929, Buharin had tried to create a bloc with the Zinoviavites and Trotskyites, although perhaps Trotsky had not officially responded yet. It also seems clear that some of the wavering Trotskyists were not ready to create this alliance yet in 1929. In any case, the Soviet government had already discovered it and confronted Buharin about it. This is what the official history of the Communist Party states. Quote, At the beginning of 1929, it was discovered that Buharin, authorized by the group of right capitulators, had formed connections with the Trotskyites through Kamenev and was negotiating an agreement with them for a joint struggle against the party. Unquote. According to Buharin's friend, revisionist Humbert Rose, the Buharin rightist group had terrorist plans against Stalin's life already since 1929 and already had an embryonic alliance with the Zinoviavites and Trotskyites. By 1932, this had evolved into a firm program known as the Ryutin Platform, and the same year, the bloc was officially formed on Trotsky's orders. Now, let's discuss the behavior of people at the different trials. So at their trial, Zinoviev and Kamenev had simply denied almost everything and just lied all the time. Naturally, they had never revealed, you know, this whole thing of like, uh, oh, let's unite with Buharin to murder Stalin. Like, no, of course, they didn't say anything about that. At his trial, Radek spent a lot of time explaining his motivations. And at the buharin Rykov trial, probably the most well-known incident besides the testimony of Buharin himself has to be the testimony of Trotskyist Krestinsky. It's a very interesting little uh, incident. So at the first session, Krestinsky was extremely emotional. He denied everything, and he famously shouted, I am not a Trotskyite, I have never been a Trotskyite. And then he basically just collapsed and didn't answer any questions. Some anti-communist commentators were impressed by Krestinsky and thought that he spoke the truth. Because obviously, if somebody just says, no, it wasn't me, I didn't do it, then of course that has to be the truth, right? So then in a following session, Krestinsky is brought back and then he admits that actually the charges are true and that he, of course, is a Trotskyist. Then those commentators claim that, oh, Krestinsky must have been coerced to state that he's a Trotskyist. But actually, Krestinsky was a very well-known Trotskyist. It was well known that Krestinsky had, for a really long time, been a Trotskyist. He had belonged to the Trotskyist opposition in the 1920s, and everybody in the USSR knew it. So his emotional, hysterical denials, saying that, no, I've never been a Trotskyist, never been a Trotskyist, they were obviously false, and only a product of desperation. Nobody at the time took Krestinsky's denial seriously. If Krestinsky had said, I am not currently a Trotskyist, then it would have at least been possible, but he screamed repeatedly, I have never been a Trotskyist, I have never been a Trotskyist, which was just blatantly absurd. So at uh, a later session of the trial, he explained that he was simply being hysterical and that he just denied everything because of uh, panic. This seems entirely believable. It's much more likely than any other possibility. Otherwise, we would have to assume that the organizers of the trial had basically ordered Krestinsky to act out this hysterical episode, which probably would have required the skills of a professional actor. 
Buharin at this trial tried to not agree with anything that the prosecutor said. He was as difficult as he could possibly be, which again testifies to the truthfulness and legitimacy of this trial because if this trial had been somehow scripted, then they probably would have had Buharin be a little bit more uh, cooperative, but he was extremely difficult. He minimized his guilt at every opportunity, he rationalized everything that he did, and he tried to paint himself as uh, some kind of martyr. He claimed that he never knew that his friends and supporters were doing uh, criminal acts, and that he had nothing to do with their crimes, but he still very generously said that he accepts responsibility for what they did. Well, what kind of statement is that? If you supposedly had nothing to do with what they're doing, you still say you want to take responsibility for it? No, he was just trying to make himself look like some kind of innocent martyr, and to avoid any kind of guilt. He denied knowing anything about assassinations, he denied knowing anything about uh, espionage or treason. A small detail which most people probably miss is that Buharin constantly tried to attack the communist Valerian Kubushev, who had recently been murdered by the rightists. So Kubushev had been a supporter of Stalin and a member of the Politburo, but he was known as a radical and he had previously been close to left communism. So Buharin constantly tried to insert statements about Kuybyshev in order to demonstrate that left communists were not so bad and left communists were not disloyal. This is one of the many little examples of Buharin trying to use these cunning strategies to try to deny everything and try to somehow destroy the credibility of the case, even though it didn't really work. If anything, it kind of goes against what he's trying to do. Like, granted, the court didn't like what he was doing one bit, they hated it, but it only proves that even if Kuybyshev uh, was close to left communism in the past and he had made certain mistakes, he still became a good Marxist-Leninist in the end. So it actually disproves the idea that if anyone had ever held positions that uh, Stalin didn't like, that they would just be marginalized or something. Buharin used this strategy particularly when the court was discussing the left communist and left SR coup attempt of 1918. The left SRs decided that Lenin should be overthrown and arrested. Other high-ranking government officials who supported Lenin's policy, namely Stalin and Sverdlov, also had to be arrested. Trotsky did not need to be arrested because he opposed Lenin's position, which is true. The left communists, although they had negotiated about this whole plan, they did not end up joining in this uh, left SR uprising due to tactical considerations. Buharin admitted this, and it is well known, I've quoted his Pravda article earlier. However, he denied the charge that the plan had been to execute Lenin, Stalin and Sverdlov. The prosecutor then pointed out that Bolshevik leaders might not surrender without a fight, and then violence might have to be used in order to subdue them, which would lead to them being murdered, but Buharin uh, simply refused to answer this line of questioning. He just claimed, no, no, we just wanted to arrest them. And then they kept asking, well, what if they refuse to be arrested? And he just kept saying, no, like, we would just arrest them. What if they refuse to be arrested? Well, you know, we would just arrest them. We wouldn't, you know. So he refused to admit that they probably would have needed to kill them. The charges mentioned at this trial truly were more monstrous than before, such as the plot to murder Lenin and also the plot to murder Maxim Gorky. However, the plot to arrest and overthrow Lenin was already well known. It just hadn't been put into this kind of context before. It had been assumed that Buharin's and Trotsky's oppositional activities had ended and that they had become loyal to Lenin and to the party. But now it was discovered that that was false and when it was put into this proper context, the grotesquely horrible nature of their plan became clear. It was so horrible, in fact, that many people refused to believe it. Buharin had admitted that the left communists had discussed with the left SRs to arrest and overthrow Lenin in a coup. When you ask, since Buharin was capable of that, would he be capable of carrying out another coup attempt against Stalin? The answer is obviously yes. So in order to deny that, people simply refuse to believe that uh, Buharin ever had any kind of plan to overthrow Lenin. But the problem is that Buharin himself admitted it in 1924. Why would he admit it in 1924 if it wasn't true? If he had only admitted it at the trial, then at least you could say, oh, he was coerced to say that at the trial. But he didn't only say it at the trial, he already had said it in 1924. So it seems pretty difficult to deny. And of course also there's the stuff about 
the plot together with Zinoviev to murder Stalin in 1929. So, pretty horrific. The plot to murder Maxim Gorky was particularly horrible. Gorky, he was already an old man, so if one day he just died, it wouldn't necessarily raise any suspicion. But then uh, Gorky's son also died, and Gorky's son was pretty young, so his death was a little odd. Well, it turns out that they were both murdered by the same person, their doctor, who had actually been coerced into it by Yagoda and the right opposition. Why was that necessary? Well, Gorky's son had to be killed so that they could get to Gorky and then kill him. So they didn't actually care about his son, they just wanted to get him out of the way. And why exactly was it so important to kill Gorky? Because Gorky had a lot of influence on the literary and artistic and generally uh, intelligentsia circles and community internationally. And Gorky used all of this influence to paint the USSR and Stalin in a very positive light and to support Soviet foreign policy objectives. This foreign policy consisted of trying to create a collective defense treaty against aggressive states, that is, primarily against fascist states. This actually kind of worked. The USSR had briefly a defensive agreement with France and Czechoslovakia, even though France eventually backed out of it, and the USSR also temporarily had improved relations with the UK in the mid-1930s. So, for the upcoming war, it was highly important to remove all of this, to remove as much support from Stalin as possible. Rykov's last plea is very interesting, especially when he discusses the murder of Maxim Gorky. He basically admits all his other crimes, but he defends himself against that particular murder, and the way he does it is quite interesting. So he says that defendant Enukidze, quote, only said that we should politically liquidate Gorky, unquote. So in other words, Rykov in no way actually denies the murder. In fact, he testifies against Enukidze, but he claims that he just didn't understand what Enukidze meant. He's saying that, uh, oh, when Enukidze said we should politically liquidate Gorky, I thought that he meant we should somehow get him out of politics. He didn't understand that it meant assassination. So he doesn't actually deny that Gorky was murdered. He uh, actually testifies that, yeah, Yagoda and Enukidze had him killed, but uh, I didn't have anything to do with it. I just didn't understand what they were talking about. Of course, it's possible that Rykov is lying. It's very possible that he did know that they were going to assassinate Gorky and he's just trying to deny it. But this event surely wouldn't have been scripted. This has to be a real event. Because again, it's just so convoluted that it doesn't really serve a good propagandist purpose. Many other defendants, of course, lied in their last pleas, most blatantly Buharin. They tried to save themselves by claiming that they repent of all their crimes. And they tried to protect other hidden conspirators. They even mentioned that they hated Yezhov, even though Yezhov himself was the most powerful rightist conspirator still out there. If the trial had been scripted, they surely would not have included mentions of Yezhov, especially since Yezhov at that point was already being suspected. The buharin Rykov trial also mentions the topic of nationalists, uh, fascists and separatist groups who worked with the opposition. Separatists were also among the defendants. The nationalists served as a link to fascist powers. The oppositionists also maintained their own communications with foreign fascists, but also with the local fascist separatists. The opposition had agreed to give Soviet territories to the fascist powers, and one way to facilitate this was by supporting separatism. During this period, Trotsky began to publish writings which called for the separation of Ukraine from the USSR, which I'm sure people say is a pure coincidence. It is repeatedly mentioned at this trial that Trotsky and Buharin wanted to restore capitalism. This was rejected by their defenders, because in their minds the charge is just absurd. They said that Trotsky and Buharin were not supporters of capitalism. They wouldn't want to restore capitalism. But actually, this is just based on ignorance. It should be understood that by restoration of capitalism, they meant a return to the NEP which is something that the Trotskyist and Buharinist opposition definitely wanted. This was actually clarified at the trial that that is what restoration of capitalism means, but it often gets lost. People don't really realize that or remember it. However, Trotsky and Buharin considered that the return to NEP would mean that they would have to give more power to capitalists than before, they would have to give more concessions to foreign investors, and they would also have to curtail democracy. Radek and Buharin both discussed this in detail. 
And again, this is not really unprecedented. The whole uh, program of the right opposition had been exactly to continue the NEP, but make it even more right-wing and even more capitalist. That was their program. It's not really a secret. So all of that, and also the curtailing of democracy, was considered necessary by the opposition so that they could hold power and build up productive forces. For Buharin, it was based on his rightist economic views, and for Trotsky, it was based on his idea that socialism cannot be built in one country. Now, lastly, some concluding remarks. The trial materials are full of all kinds of details, and I couldn't possibly deal with all of them. In fact, I've already been going on for a really long time. I think that anyone interested in the trials should read the material, and hopefully with some of this context and explanation that I've given, you can understand the material more easily. The materials convincingly show the guilt of the oppositionists, and any honest critical reader should conclude that the trials were accurate and bona fide. It is quite natural that the main tactic of the anti-communists is to discourage people from actually reading these materials, and instead they just spread lies and caricatures about them. And if people do read the materials, anti-communists try to confuse everything and they certainly don't give any of the proper context or explanation of what's actually happening, so they hope if somebody actually does read them that they wouldn't understand. Like I said, it can be a bit complicated, but I still do recommend reading the materials, and if there's something uh, weird and something you don't understand, hopefully this video will help.